said, oh, he had brought the dogs to his host family and he's coming to see old man, old man finish, you know. He had finished just a couple of minutes ahead of me. So, that's a lot. Sailing down the trail, that of course has gotten disallowed. I, um, I introduced the, the wind sail to the, to the racing situation and uh, when people realized I had a lot more hot air than the rest of them, they... <laughs> I actually pushed the issue. I, went, I, had, I got together with a sail maker and ended up making some pretty, pretty skookum sails, but they were going to be front mounted on my sled and would harness a lot more than just the tail weight. So, so I presented it to the rules committee thinking, of course, everybody has the same amount of wind. If you want to carry a sail, you should be able to sail. You know, I mean, it's, the wind is there for everybody. Plus, later, of course, we found the, the explorers and the early mushers, they used wind sails all the time. But uh, they disallowed it, so I just, no more sailing. Do this is the mushers have the seats that they sit on? Seats are, that's, that, that was an example. I said, so you don't let me sail, do you not let me sit down? Because that makes my sled a couch. You know, no, no, we, can, we can sit down. So we're using some of those indigenous, indigenous trail, I should go back to, so this one, look how it's worn into the tundra by uh, centuries of travel. And we get a privilege of traveling over the, the old trails. Um, a good tripod is a semi-permanent or permanent piece of marking that's three sticks put together, two the same length and the, and the long one. The third one should point in the direction of travel. That's a, a good trail marker. And uh, we, of course, we navigate by sometimes by stars or moons because um, later on it has two or three moons when you're on the coast, you know. <laughs> There's two North Stars up there, and, you know, you're getting so wrong. I could write a book on hallucinations alone. When we used to be on the trail for 17 days, man, oh man, we had free hallucinations from, from about halfway on. Now that we're doing it in half the time, we, we hardly hallucinate anymore. So. <laughs> And maybe that's why I ran 2,000 mile races back to back. But that again, you know, the sun rises, the sun downs, the moon rises, the moon downs. It's just, it's unbelievable, the intensity of the, of the climate. I love this because it shows the interest of the kids. When, when I did a rut comes through, of course, school is out, everybody's at the checkpoint. And just to show you a little bit, uh, you know about baseball and maybe football and basketball. And when these kids come to the checkpoint, uh, watching the vets interact with my dogs and, and me, they will look at the dogs and say, where's Milk Cow? <laughs> or, you know, is Eleanor still in lead? Or, D2 was in the many commercials, fortunately, with me, and one of the most famous one, he drove off my dog truck and I was running behind. And to this day, sometimes kids come and say, does D2 really know how to drive? <laughs> the dog is long gone, and of course the commercial is not shown anymore, but certain dogs become very famous. And, and that just shows you how, how in tune the kids are with, with their uh, indigenous sport. Uh, and that to me is a great honor. And the fact that there's no MD on the trail, of course, is just a sidebar. <laughs> when I modified my hand four days before the race, I, I got these three fingers in a, in a dado blade on a table saw and then decided to run. Of course, I was supposed to race one-handed and from about the third or fourth checkpoint on, the vets would... And the first time was really funny. I, we didn't eat dinner just now, so uh, I, I said, Doc, I need you, I need to uh, maybe put some sutures in, and he says, what dog? You know, I said, oh, oh, shit, well, you know, well, I don't think we can have a dog with sutures running the race, and I said, no, it's, it's the two-legged dog. So he brought his surgical kit in, you know, it's a green packet, you know, you guys know, and, you know, it's all, everything is in there, tools and sutures, and, and vets are usually pretty hardy fellows. So I had my hand severely bandaged, and we were sitting across from each other on a, in a one-room cabin on a, t on a table in Roan River, and, and he unfurled his tools, and I unfurled my bandage, and, and I said, hey, look, it's growing back. It's, uh, it's green, and it's almost back to normal size. Uh, it was uh, kind of throbbing a little bit, doing that pulsating thing, uh, and it, of course, needed, needed to be put together in some places. And, 
he about passed out. I'm sure he's seen cows and horses, you know, slain open, but he never, he never quite worked on the amputated fresh fingers. So. Of course, subsequently, in every checkpoint, the vets had to see the finger and work on it. <laughs> so I joke, I gave a lot of vets the finger. <laughs> Which is really not what I normally do. So, but, um, it helped, and I finished Lucky 13 that year. So, so I, at least I got to it. I, I knew it was going to be a painful event. And um, I figured that was the first race I ever started, thinking I might not get to the finish line. No, it's going to be miserable, and I might as well be miserable on the trail rather than be miserable at home. So um, sometimes it gets pretty flat. This is this is where Libby Riddles won the one that uh, her I did already nineteen, I believe this was eighty five, when the boys were playing basketball in Czech Tulik, and it was so nasty that uh, only the best of the leaders could make it through a storm, and she tied herself to the sled and trusted her lead dog by the name of Sister who belonged to an Eskimo friend of mine, Joe Garney. She literally just tied herself to the sled and told sister to go and she got to... At the time, there is a shelter cabin off the, off the site, but at the time there was no shelter cabin yet. She got to this, uh, to this outcropping of rocks and stayed there and was miserable for four hours and then kept on, on going. It's, it's basically 56 miles across the frozen ocean. Not much for landmarks and only the best of the... The get there. And that set her apart, that gave her a four hour lead that was whittled away throughout the, the last 200 miles, but she become, became the first woman to win the other run. And of course you're starting to, to wonder how long, and I, I know you guys are wondering too, how long is it going on yet? Um, there's there is, uh, ongoing, ongoing challenges when the wind blows on those flat on those flat uh, ocean passages like, like we are here. We're actually on frozen ocean. Uh, the, ice, the eyes of the dog sometimes get caked with ice and we, we stop and we clean them out. Uh, in that 91 storm I saw a, a new thing for the first time and never seen it since. Uh, it actually froze the dog's little, little masks on their faces. And um, we let I'd leave them on for a while and, and ever, every 20 minutes to 30 20 to 30 minutes, we we take them off. But what was really cool is when I took those cups, I called them cups off their noses, and they were just like little clown masks, really. You know, you get those different dog dog noses that have a little scoop, little rubber band, and 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 they just looked like that. They had little masks on their faces, and I I learned to take them off, and they liked that. But when you look into them, inside that cup. There was two fang, two snake fang-like protrusions, two icicles that were shaped exactly the shape of their nostrils. That was that ice was protruding way into their into their noses, and the the body heat would melt them in perfect snake-like fang, curved just like the dog's noses were. And if you took them off just right, I I would look at it, and it's so vivid in my mind. That's such a such a surreal, crazy thing. Of course, you don't save them. You can't, you know. They just, you know, but it was it was just unreal what those dogs can do. Then they, you know, okay, you know, what do we do next? <laughs> water. When now, when you see water, now you really you got a pucker factor of probably a twenty on a scale of ten. Now we're really, if you see open water on the coast, it gets really dangerous and. The most scared I've been is probably in a situation like that. That brown stuff or the dark stuff is water in the background. And I followed an old trail once and everything was kind of going, everything was going up and down. And I thought, that's, that's really crazy. That can't be what I'm thinking it is. This ocean can't be moving. And, and I pushed off real hard between my runners and two inches of ice gave way to green, gray, bubbly water. And talk about a cardiac test. That's a that's a good test for your ticker. I beeline it right over to the land. And this year, for instance, we couldn't use this section. There is, of course, an overland trail that has had to be used. The mail has to go through a lot of this. A lot of this, if not 95 percent of the trail that we're using, was original mail routes, Pony Express uh, type. You know, the mail had to go through. The goods had to come in. 